gracious Heavenly Father, once again we come before you by means of the Lord Jesus Christ as your children. And in the Holy Spirit, Father, we, we seek your truth. We uh, desire, Lord, to know you, uh, to have understanding of your word that you have given us. So, Father, we pray this morning that each one of us here, you would have, by your Holy Spirit, know and understand the truth that you would have them to know. And, Father, that we would be comforted, that we would be encouraged, and, Father, most of all, that we would know your peace. We thank you for this time, and we, we ask your presence here with us this morning, and that you be glorified. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. I have to believe that that song demonstrates what, well why God has blessed us with music in the church. When you hear those words so beautifully sung and accompanied so well with the piano, um, it's not just a nice sentiment, but there's power in knowing those are the words of your Lord that he has spoken, um, a comforter that he leaves with you, a peace that's not as the world gives. Do you think, have you thought just about those words? The world is offering you something, but God has given you something so much greater. We don't try to take both, but we look unto him. Thank you, Anna and Jared, for your ministry to the body. Um, let's uh, open to Matthew chapter 22. And let's spend time now worshiping in the reading and preaching of his word. Matthew chapter 22. This is, as you remember last from last week, this is a... Uh, Two part is a continuation of what we begun. It's a discussion that's still going on, and there's activities that are going to be yet going on, even as we complete this week and go into the next week with the scriptural text that we are looking at. To give a good picture of the context, let's read from verse 15 through 33. But just so you can be prepared, our message is going to be from 23 to 33. But I want to get the fullness of context. So if you would. Uh, Follow along with me, Matthew chapter 22, verse 15. Then went the Pharisees and took counsel as to how they might entangle him in his talk. And they sent out unto him their disciples, and with the Herodians, saying, Master, we know that thou art true and teach the way of God and truth. Neither cares for any man, for you regards not the person of men. Tell us, therefore... What do you think? Is it lawful to give you tribute unto Caesar or not? But Jesus perceived their wickedness. And he said, why do you tempt me, you hypocrites? Show me the tribute money. And they brought the to him a penny. And he said unto them, whose image is this and whose superscription? And they said unto him, Caesar's. Then he said unto them, Render, therefore, unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. And when they heard these words, they marveled and left him, and they went on their way. And that same day came to him the Sadducees, which said, There is no resurrection. And they asked him, saying, Master, Moses said, If a man die, having no children with his Having no children, his brother should marry his wife and raise up seed unto his brother. Now there were with us seven brethren, the first when he had married a wife, deceased, and having no issue, left his wife unto his brother, likewise a second also, and a third, and the seventh. And last of all, the woman died also. Therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife shall she be of the seven, for they all had her. And Jesus answered and said unto them, You do err, not knowing the scriptures, 
nor the power of God. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven, but as touching the resurrection of the dead, have you not read that which was spoken unto you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And when the multitude heard this, they were astonished at his doctrine. May God bless the reading of his word. Last week, and I'm going to do a quick summary because there's so much here. We could spend so much time here, and I want to, I want to do it in an um, honoring way and, and get through what we need to get through. So for a little review, last week in relation to application, or what I would offer is more in regards to perception, in regards to perceiving truth of the text, or having a present understanding, we said we would take note of a few key words over the next two weeks. So we said that last week. There's going to be a few key words that are going to pop up in our text. As a reminder, those words were counsel, words, understanding, and doctrine. There are a few more words, such as error and knowing, but those are going to be secondary, or a better way of saying it, they're going to serve in, in relation to those primary texts. So they're, they're going to kind of serve as an emphasis or giving of understanding as to how those primary words are being used. Now, of those primary words, we first came to the word counsel, and we discussed that. And what we'd said was, for counsel to be good, it must be founded upon good doctrine. And if you remember the text that we just read, what was the crowd astonished at? His doctrine. So we start with counsel, and we're going to start with an astonished crowd at the doctrine of Christ. So it must be founded upon good doctrine, or rather, we went into saying a way to describe that or understand that better, perhaps, is to say it has two properties. Number one, it must be founded upon a proper understanding of the Word of God, which is good doctrine. And secondly, it must be purposed in love for truth, a desire to know truth. If you remember, disciples of the Pharisees came to Jesus not out of a desire to know truth, not out of a desire to get counsel. They saw counsel together and tried to seek a way not to know truth together, but to entrap Christ by his own words. And they came forth to do that. Then at the end of last week, we closed our observing of Christ the Lord's interaction with the Herodians and the disciples of the Pharisees by seeking to observe three things as an introduction to this week and a closing of last week. And we said between these messages, I want you to see if you can perceive or observe these three things. The first is that they, they do not properly give unto God what belongs to God in recognition of his word, in recognition of truth, in recognition of understanding and proper perception. They don't give that to God. They seek that of themselves. Second, they lack the ability to understand the word of God. And not recognizing God as God, they are neither able to properly understand the word of God. This isn't that they don't read the Word of God or know the Word of God. They probably know the Word of God in relation to what it says in the Old Testament better than most, if not all, of us sitting here this morning. But they lack the ability to properly perceive the Word of God. And thus, the third thing is that they are ignorant of the power of God, which means godliness as an application of everyday life makes no sense to them. So then, we could say this. When one doesn't give properly to God what belongs to God, they can be found to lack or quench the ability to properly understand or perceive the Word of God and thus remain ignorant as to the power of God and not know how he is living and active in everyday life. And we see that in this text. 
In other words, you might say it this way, pride begets ignorance of truth and ignorance begets pride. This is especially true when discussing education and religion. These well-educated disciples of the Pharisees and the prominent Herodians came to Christ not, as in, not to attribute the word of God to God and thus recognize Christ, but to attribute all correctness unto themselves and trap, in this case, truth, which is Christ, and thus retain their own influence over the masses. Christ highlights this to them when he says, Give to Caesar that which is Caesar's, but to God that which is God." And that silences them. And then they heard these words, verse 22, they marvel and they leave him and went this way. You just picture these disciples saying, we need to regroup, reload. <laughs> he got us. That's it. We, we have no comeback for that. Now, as they retreat, the next group comes in. That same day, the Sadducees come to him and they they are the ones which say there is no resurrection and they're going to ask him something concerning the resurrection. So the same day comes another wealthy power group. And this is the wealthy power group of, of this culture, of our context. They held the majority, 70 seats in the ruling council of the Sanhedrin. These would be the premier, the ultimate thinkers, the influencers of the day. The Sadducees is what today we would call self-sufficient in their understanding and their, um, yeah, in their understanding of life. Now, the interesting thing in going in and studying the Sadducees is a lot of us today in here, self-included, would see self-sufficient as a good thing, right? We would see it in a whole different context. And you hear that word self-sufficient, and you're like, great, I want to be self-sufficient. What I want to offer, again, as a, as a fellow who says, here's self-sufficient in the context of our modern day and says, oh, that's great. I want to offer that perhaps we can learn some of its pitfalls from the Sadducees and their interaction with Christ. And maybe in understanding the importance of words would learn that maybe that's not the best description of what we should desire. I know when we think of, again, self-sufficiency, we mean in terms of not being dependent upon another power or entity of this world. That's usually what we mean. We, we can survive out there on our own. But we need to be careful with that mindset. The Sadducees had gone so far in self-sufficiency that they had denied the power of God and instead made much of the accomplishments of man. If we are going to have a kingdom unto ourselves, we will earn it through our righteousness in holding to the law of Moses. We will gain it. We will do it. And when our time up is here, we pass it on to the next generation and then the next generation, and we will continue to go, and that is how we will spread our power and our supremacy through the world. We could say cautiously that the Sadducees did well in the area that they held high regard for the Word of God, especially that the first five books, Genesis, starting with Genesis. And they were very studious in this, looking at Genesis through Deuteronomy. And the fallacy began, however, when the Sadducees... Um, begin to show us they don't have the ability to proper recognize what is said in those books. They were so self-sufficient that even though they held to the word of God being supreme, they denied the word of God's involvement in everyday life. So it's supreme in the sense of a higher understanding it's good for brownie points, right? It's a higher understanding, and we're the higher understanders, and so we're on the council. We're going to make the decisions. But in regards to everyday life, man, that's just life. And you got to be self-sufficient. And you got to do it. Now, I want you to think on that slowly for me. The danger of self-sufficiency as a doctrine is that its root denies the power of God 
by denying his involvement in our everyday lives. This could sound bad to us here as a church, but really, I think if we were to observe our conversations with people, or if I were to just describe some of my conversations with, with many um, churchgoers, I don't think it's very far-fetched to say that the majority of church growers, goers, if they don't say it, they at the very least practice such a doctrine. God is good. It's kind of like the higher learning. It's the ultra, ultra uh, spiritual stuff, which maybe that's one step beyond the Sadducees because they didn't hold to the spiritual reality. But it's kind of like it's a different part of life, everyday life, man. It's every man for himself. We got to get up. We got to strive. And maybe God's involved in some of the bigger things that are out there, but really not everything. It's just certain stuff. And these type of things, it, these doctrines creep into our minds and our hearts. And it does us well to step back and observe it. What you need to ask yourself in regards to your doctrine is how involved is God in your everyday life? That will reveal a lot about your doctrine. Go through a day of your life and then ask yourself honestly, how involved is God? And then observe where you go with that question. Do you begin to reason through it? Or do you say, I want to know and start to study scripture? If you begin to reason through it, you're practicing the doctrine and exercises of the Sadducees. If you begin to say, God, I want understanding, and you seek the scripture that God might give you a perceived reality into his work, that would be worship. And that would be different than the Sadducees. Second, the Sadducees denied any resurrection of the dead. This will lead to the third, the Sadducees being, or this rather will lead to the Sadducees being strong opposers of the apostles in their teaching of the resurrection of Christ and even a future resurrection of believers. So this is going to continue on, this wrestling match of their doctrine. And then this belief by the Sadducees is going to continue into the third doctrinal error, which is going to be the denying of any afterlife at all. So they believe when the person perished, that was it. There wasn't any judgment, no reward. That was just it. They did what they were supposed to do, and that's, that's done. Now, if you follow all of that, you can see the contradiction of thought. But you can still also see the influences today. You might walk through their thinking saying, if life is about your ability, then once your ability here is done, then also life is done. That would be the Sadducees doctrine summed up. <laughs> but I would offer that that's the way we've been schooled. If teaching and training is about your life here, then once your life here is done, is not life done? Well, let's put in contrast to the Pharisee view. The Pharisee view might be said something like this. Life is about your ability, and the afterlife is the reward or punishment of your ability. So, again, if you observe it, they're both the same error. If life is about what you do here, then it's either done here or once it's done here, it's rewarded there. Meaning the next step is the worship or glorification of what you did or the punishment of what you failed to do or did incorrectly, which again shapes the doctrine, the teaching, and the moving of the masses. And the time of Christ, the masses were being moved by these doctrines. You could call it enslaved by the education of the time. And I would offer, it's not, I don't even have to state the application because it's the same today. The reality of doctrine, true doctrine, is life cannot be found in you. Life is only known in Christ. We only know life because we abide in Christ Jesus, our Lord, who is the author and the giver of life. 
God is the giver of life. Fail to know God, then you will have no perception or understanding of what life truly is. Jesus came that you might know life and know the abundance of it, know the reality of it. You might know a lot of stuff. You might know a lot of so-called knowledge. You might know a lot of strivings here in this world. You might collect a lot of stuff, but you won't know life. You've all heard it, right? It's one of those catchy phrases. That it's almost embarrassing, one of those sayings, that, but it's so catchy, everybody still uses it. No God, no life, no God, no life. K-N-O-W and then N-O, right? If you know God, you're going to know life. And you could, it is, you could say that there's truth to that here when speaking of the human understanding of life. To have an actual perception of God and the truths of God, to be able to perceive the truths of God is to be able to perceive the truths of life. But to have the inability to perceive the truths of God or to not have the time or the effort to do that is to not know life. So they come to him discussing life in regards to the resurrection, the bodily resurrection of life, and they're at the standpoint of not believing it. And so they say, Master, Moses said, why do they say Moses said? They held high regard for what books? Those first five books, the books of the law. That's what they say. So they're using their books. Moses said, so the authority said, if a man dies... Having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up a seed unto his brother. Now there were with us seven brethren, and the first, when he had married a wife, deceased, and having no issue, left his wife unto his brother. Likewise, the second also, and the third unto the seventh. And the last of all, the woman died also, therefore in the resurrection, whose wife shall she be of the seven? For they all had her. Basically, what they are saying is, if you follow the law of Moses, the authority, if you follow that through, you cannot logically and reasonably believe in a resurrection. If you follow the law of Moses, it makes no sense. So their argument or their perception on why the idea of a bodily resurrection is foolish is given. Their strategy of argument is to come up with an example that makes the one who holds to the afterlife and the bodily resurrection look like an unreasonable, uneducated loon. That's their strategy, is this is going to, no matter how you answer, you're just going to look foolish here. And we're going to look like we are the wise ones. So let us tell you about the law of Moses, which you gave him. All right, that's the reality. So Jesus responds, and I'm going to give three teaching points of his response. The, the first, his initial response, which you could label his, uh, perception, is the first area of how we observe Jesus' teaching. Verse 29, Jesus answered and said unto them, You do error and not know the Scriptures nor the power of God. In this first thing, what Jesus perceives as they are coming to him is he perceives the manner and the error of their coming and he perceives two errors and before we look at these two errors again about Christ our Lord let me say this as a teacher Christ gives us an example that in teaching one must have a perceptive grasp not just of what they are speaking on but in perceiving to whom they're speaking he doesn't just say thing he perceives who's coming to him how they are coming to him and what is actually going on in the words that are said. Christ exercises that here, just as he did with the disciples of the Pharisees, right? When they came to him, you're coming to me pretending you're something you're not. He says, you hypocrites. Why are you doing that? And then he goes on and says, I'll answer your question anyways. So it's good in recognizing the placement of the student. Now, Christ is going to highlight to the Sadducees that in their self-sufficiency, especially of thought and reason, they should be able to perceive or understand the answer to their question from their own scriptures. The fact that they cannot points to two errors 
in their educational process. Okay, so these are the educated who are educating the others. The huge moment here that you have to recognize is that the two errors that are highlighted by Christ are in regards to the education and the ability to understand in relation or directed to the wealthy, powerful, political, religious leaders of this time. He is speaking to the leader, not just the ones who, who teach the subjects, but the ones who say how things are done. And he says, you don't know the scriptures and you don't know the power of God. You don't know the scriptures and you don't know the power of God. It doesn't say that you don't claim the scriptures to be the word of God, but you don't know the scriptures. The word for knowing here is the active perceiving of something to behold it. It is to observe it. Their inability to do this has led them to error. And that's one of those subwords. This word error is equivalent to saying you're walking the road of heretics. It's a powerful word. The word for error here is to deceive, to cause to go astray, to lead away from truth, to practice heresy. So you practice heresy because you don't know the scriptures and you don't understand the power of God. So I go back to the question, how involved is God in your everyday life? Well, there's some things, but not other things. I'm not saying this, but I feel like it wouldn't be too far of a stretch from the text to say, Jesus would say, you're walking down the road of heresy, my friend, because of not knowing the scriptures. And because of that, you don't know the power of God in everyday life. And because of that, you deny the resurrection and you deny the presence of everlasting life. The not knowing here is, again, to not know by perception. It's to not even be able to perceive or discern or discover. Unable to understand or sense as one is able to understand or sense the cold versus the warmth. Your, your nerves endings are gone. You can't, you can't sense things. So, they lack, you could say, they lack the medium necessary to understand the scripture. Now, that should be encouraging to you because when Christ ascended into heaven, he said, I will send you a helper. And that helper is what helps to give us understanding into the text of Scripture. Now, here's a little address that perhaps um, I could say is to you, the present day church congregation. I'm speaking to believers. I believe that this is a fair exhortation and is affirmed throughout Scripture, but especially here in Christ's teaching. And it would be this. Believer, you must believe that the starting point of all education, of your learning, of your acquiring knowledge, walking through, no matter what age, the starting point of all education is the knowledge of God through the Scriptures. As the Scriptures say, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of all knowledge. The ability to perceive or understand the life and power of the scriptures in, through, and beyond everyday life is the aim of education. That knowledge of scriptures is not the knowledge that we find a verse faster than anyone else. That's not the knowledge I'm thinking of. That's the type of knowledge that leads us to the hair heretic statements such as it's good to know the Bible but that doesn't put bread on the table right that would be a Sadducee type statement that's not the perception that Jesus is talking about neither is the knowledge the knowledge that can perform good deeds better than anyone else it's it's not even knowledge in the sense of a Bible degree 
The knowledge that we're talking about is one that perceives the living, active work, nature, and character of Almighty God as testified to in the Scriptures, present and active today, and yet revealing itself in the coming future. That's the perception and the knowledge that's being discussed. That is, when you are as a parent discussing it with your children, I don't want them to know the order of the books of the Bible. I mean, that's good. It's fun. But I want them to know God. And I want them to know that God has, has blessed us with every blessing and will see us through every storm of life. That when we sing, it is well with my soul, it is literally well with my soul. I want them to know that before they know two plus two. If they live this life and my kids are laughed at because they never know two plus two, and I can say that because they all know that already. <laughs> they never know two plus two, but they know God is alive. Then they will make all of those that know well beyond two plus two seem the fool. And the same is true with each of you. I don't know what levels of education any of you had, but none of it can beat the degree of perceiving God. That is to say, education or discipleship is to perceive the fullness of the Word of God in everyday life. That's a wrestling, isn't it? As adults, isn't that what you wait? That's what you want to wake up and you want to wrestle through. You want to perceive God in this the day that the Lord has made. And the only way to perceive that is to perceive the scriptures. And that's what the Sadducees couldn't perceive. And so they said, we must be self-sufficient. Because we hold high regards for this word, the law of Moses. We're in this day in, re in relation to Rome. God, it's not about God and what's going to happen later. It's about what's happening now. Once, once our time is up, it's done. So we must do the best that we can do right now until our, until our days are done. And Jesus says, that's a fallacy form of education. And it's leading you astray and it's leading the people astray. So it's to perceive the fullness of the Word of God in life, that one might know the fullness of life by knowing and perceiving more clearly He who gives life. For the believer, that is the case and point of education. Know God. Know God. The Sadducees did not perceive the Scriptures and thus had no clue about life. Can you picture that? Webby. I don't know if any of you are in college would have go up to a prof and one of the times that they're really teaching, this is what you need to do. This is how you get successful in life. And just point out, that's clueless, man. That's error. That's error. Don't laugh and don't brush that off. When you know the scriptures, the result is you know the power of God. Why? Why? Why is that true? Because all of you might be looking and thinking at, to, towards me. Um, I have bills. I have struggles. I do have everyday life. The reason that, or the why to that is because you perceive the scriptures in your everyday life. You observe its working unto eternal life. You see in the struggles you see in, in the every parts of walk as you're observing the scriptures and as your heart and mind are turned towards what is God's, meaning life is God's and giving unto God what is God's, you begin to see his hand in all of those things. And it's not as the world gives it, right? It's not the same thing. The world, it's endless toil. And it's, you're continuing to try and get things, and the things that you're getting are supposed to bring you comfort. And they might bring something for a little bit, but then they break, or you need a new one, or they cost more than what you thought it was going to cost, or there's a monthly fee, or whatever else comes into it. And it's more and more and more and more. And the striving with God is in striving to know God and observe His work within you. And in the midst of the toils of life, it's a perceived response that is what is worship 
And it's amazing, and there's no real way to describe it to the student other than to get the student to read the text and pray unto God for the heart of a disciple. You perceive the scriptures in your everyday life and you observe its working unto eternal life. You have what we even spoke of this past Monday as a threefold remembrance. And I've spoken to of it on other numerous occasions. When you study the word of God to know God, you study in the sense of remembering the past, understanding the present, and looking forward unto the future. You see the whole of the text of what is spoken. You see his faithfulness in the past. You know his present life today, and you affirm your standing and your comfort in the promises yet to come. You know, you understand in past, present, and future tense. The Sadducees, in all of their study, success, money, influence, and power, had none of that. It was all here, it was all now, and it was all lacking completely in understanding of actual life. They had no clue about life. But the, the, the deceptive part that you have to recognize is the people below the Sadducees didn't see that at that time. That's a great revelation that Christ is bringing in. That's his, his teaching that is amazing and astonishing the people. And that's the teaching that you have in the word of God in the world that you're in. The people thought there's, there's no choice. There's, there's a debate between if it's just all here and now or if we're trying to get something in the future life, no matter what it is, it's us and we have to strive and it's an ending, endless striving and God is silent and we don't know where he's at, but we have to be self-sufficient and just try to sustain. And Christ's teaching is, no, no, that's error. That's heresy. They held on to the present, which is a first clue that you don't understand life, right? Isn't that, shouldn't that be an obvious clue of understanding? I just want to hold on to the present. I'm going to hold on to, I'm going to make the present the best that it can. You know the problem with that statement? By the time you finish the statement, the present's done. It's already the next step. This is elementary, the first elementary teaching of this present life, that it is but a vapor, and no man can hold on to it, neither of himself make anything out of a vapor. It's fleeting. Most everyone that has spoken to you throughout the years of influence, to influence your aim and what you pursue in life is exercising some form similar to the Pharisees or Sadducees doctrine for all of us. It's the culture that we're in. And Christ says in so many words, they are wrong. They are wrong. I mean, how do we get by this first sentence of a response? That's where we're at. We're in the first sentence of a response. He hasn't talked on their question yet. He just said, this is why you err. It's not just that they're wrong. It's a huge statement. These are the Sadducees, and Christ says right off, you err as a heretic errors because you don't know the Scriptures and you deny the power of God. Think on it. The Sadducees deny the bodily resurrection, and they're arguing with Christ, who is there at the Passover in preparation for his crucifixion and resurrection. Do you get the context? There's No, there's, this resurrection is just foolishness. He could just say, well, uh, give me about so many, a week or so, and we'll talk about it then, right, when I walk out of the grave. The context here is he is preparing for the great victory, and the Sadducees are in front of him denying. They're denying the power of God. Can you just imagine the, the, the power within Christ, the, the, the emotion right there? That's, he is standing on the power of God. He is, that is the power with which he is going forth. And that word power there is not just the physical, but it's also the moral ability which resides in God. 
So he is standing upon the ability of God and the character of God to do what God has said. And the heresy is that they are twisting the word of God for their own intent. And in that, insulting not only the strength of God, but the character of God. And that's why he says it's a heretic type error. And so the Sadducees' ignor ignorance or failed ability to perceive the scriptures meant that they could not comprehend God as having power over life and death. They couldn't see it. And so Christ moves to the second point of his teaching, and you could label this point correction or clarification. But I think I like correction here. So you have in the first point perception and then correction. And to do this, Christ our Lord, and saying, how have you, the Sadducees, not perceived this, moves on to instruct or offer understanding that they should have already had from Scripture. Verse 30, For in the resurrection they neither marry, that's the men, nor are given in marriage, that's the woman, but are as angels of God in heaven. I don't know how to describe the meaning of that there. They are as the angels of God in heaven, as a state of them. Sure, verse 31, that would be a good study perhaps. But as touching the resurrection of the dead, have you not read that which was spoken unto you by God, saying? Now, what you should know about the Sadducees here that he's speaking to, saying, have you not read, is to be a rabbi, you had to memorize the first five books of the Bible. To memorize those first five books, you had to have read them. <laughs> right? So he's, he's basically saying... How do you not, you did not perceive this? Again, the error, it doesn't matter if you memorize them. You have not accepted nor perceived them in the sense that it is the word of Almighty God. This is the biggest struggle. You know why it's a struggle for us in the church? Because we were taught that David and Goliath was a children's story. We were taught that Noah's Ark was a children's story. We were taught even that the life of Christ was cute in the way that he rescued the disciples from the storm. Isn't that comforting to the child? We were taught that that is life. That that same Christ is your Lord and the one that you abide in more intimately than the disciples did. More intimately. You will have a greater power. Greater work will I do in you. Have you ever thought about that? So, they memorized the first five books but they didn't get it. Christ will remind them of what they say, and then what he's going to do is he's going to demonstrate the power of proper deduction from the Word of God. And he's going to do that in his third teaching point, which you could title perception, proper perception. It's a teaching and deduction. Have you not read... Or just get the full thing. But as touching the resurrection of the dead, have you not read that which was spoken to you by God, saying, in Exodus 3, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. So deduction. If he is the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, present tense, is he not therefore the God of the living and not the God of the dead? How can you be the God of something that ceases to exist? You're trying to deny a resurrection using these circular reasoning through the words of Moses. But did God not himself make this statement? And don't you have to therefore go to the conclusion of the resurrection? Again, the primary intent of this statement, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they're not yet resurrected. They're alive, but they're not yet resurrected. The context is the resurrection from the dead. Christ is saying that God said, as Christ is now quoting from Exodus 3, that he is the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, an ascending description, and God is not the God of the dead, but the living, and that but of the living is a statement which should, it should give you the perception that the resurrection is coming. Just as if you read Job and you hear Job confess to knowing that in the latter days his flesh will see God, should have given them the perception of a bodily resurrection. Thus, 
The thrust of this teaching is that they should have perceived already from the Old Testament scriptures that the bodily resurrection from the dead is to be anticipated. They should have started from that premise, not in arguing that, you know, how could it make sense? And if it doesn't make sense, it can't be true. They should have started from the premise that because of what God said, it must be true. This teaching point is again demonstrating Christ's wisdom in knowing where the Sadducees were at and what their question was purposed in. Their question was not purposed in knowing about resurrection marriages, but in showing the resurrection as foolish. And therefore, Christ demonstrates their inability to perceive or comprehend the very part of Scripture that they so proudly claim to have memorized and be experts in. And when the multitude heard this, they were astonished at his, his being Christ, doctrine, his teaching. The multitude here is a crowd that's gathering during Passover. It's a large crowd, and they're astonished at his doctrine. The teaching and instruction here is certainly amazing. Christ has instructed in matters of policy, political, stewardship, worship, marriage, life, and the resurrection, all by answering these two questions. All of this has taken place in response to these leaders who are those who are seen as the great minds, the power of the day, the wealthy of the day, the teachers and influencers of the time. And just by means of exhortation, what we have observed is, firstly, if we are to be those who seek good counsel, instruction, and teaching, then we must found our teaching upon the Word of God and be lovers of truth. We have also highlighted together in these past two weeks that we err when we don't give properly to God which, that which belongs to God, namely, all things. And when we do that, we tend to quench and even lack the ability to properly understand the Word of God. And the result of that is we remain ignorant of the power of God. And the result of that is we come up with some form of doctrine that's a Christian version of self-sufficiency and denying the power of God. My encouragement for you in closing this morning, proper discipleship, education, exercising of good doctrine, is that which leads the disciple to recognize and nurture the ability to perceive the truth and power of God in the Holy Scriptures and thus recognize the reality of everlasting life and the coming bodily resurrection. The aim of what we know as believers, no matter what our age, the aim of what we disciple our children in, the emphasis of all learning is to affirm the power of God in the resurrection. If you know the power of God in the resurrection, you cannot deny the power of God today. And if He provides the resurrection, Will he not provide bread today? When we make less of that, we make fools of ourselves. Oh, the wrestling true, the wrestling daily. We are only wise by the grace of God, which demonstrates unto us in his wisdom the goodness of the counsel of God. In this, one learns of their personal dependence upon God and of his full sufficiency for them, not self-sufficiency. See, that's, that's the difference. The man of the world in trying to find peace in a broken world might seek to become self-sufficient, but the believer thanks God that they are dependent upon him. Thus, the aim of life is one of worship, not self, one of persevering obedience, not self-determination, one of love, not merit. One of observing the work and power of God in every circumstance rather than the ability of self to avoid any and every unwanted circumstance. God is alive and He is working within us, forming and completing His work within us. We can observe this work. And that's the greatness of our study. To observe the present active work of God in your life. Boy, wouldn't that change school? If you could go back to school, 
Wouldn't that change it for you? Help me observe what God is working in my life. Picture that contrasted against, man, you gotta work, you gotta find out what you wanna be. <laughs> you gotta seek what you wanna be, you gotta know what you wanna be, your time's running out because you're gonna have to really commit to this if you wanna obtain it and get it. But the believer says, no, Christ said, I will complete the work that I have already begun in you. I will be faithful to complete it. Man, the child of God ought to ask, what is that work? I want to see it. I want to know what you're doing in me. Bring it to life so that all glory and honor can be given unto you right now and forevermore. That's, a, that's, that, that's the glorious opportunity of the believer. He's working within us, forming and completing His work in us. We can observe this work, for that is the greatness of our study. And what you can do is, here is take wherever you are. Look at all of your toils in life. And for a moment, just notice that they're all toils. It's all toiling. Don't label something different. It's toil. It is what it is. It has to do with the fall. We toil. Now look at God. It's amazing if you do that, even in the midst of toil, how you will see His power when instead of worshiping your striving, success, and goals, you see them as a vapor and you stand amazed at God and how He's orchestrating eternity. This struck me in the most infant stages of any understanding of it in those days after my brother's home going. And going through and completing some, trying to complete the last few college papers. And seeking out, and also it was like a switch went off. God, I wanna know you as, I wanna actually perceive you. I wanna really perceive who you are and what you are doing. Jesus stands before the world leaders of his day, knowing his life was purposed in what that bodily resurrection is going to mean and the joyous glory that lies beyond it. That's where Jesus is standing. And that equips him. That truth, that understanding, with such power and wisdom that the people are amazed. We all say, God, wow, what a God of the Old Testament. Look how he provided. Or we say, God, he overcame death, and, and now we overcome in the resurrection. But what about today? What do we say today? It's usually something like this. Man, the world's a mess. Where's God? <laughs> it doesn't look good. I got to do this. I got to do that. What in Scripture are we not perceiving correctly? That makes us okay with thinking that we are doing today because for some reason God isn't as involved in our everyday lives as he once was. What is it? What is it that makes our minds okay with being so-called self-sufficient Christians? It's an oxymoron. And it's exactly what I'm afraid it makes me when I look at life that way. You know what moron means? It means notably lacking in good judgment. And when we think that we are self-sufficient Christians, it's kind of a moron statement. It is lacking in good judgment. Good judgment would say, we are fully dependent on God. Yes, wholly set apart, out of the world, right? Or not of the world, set apart from that, but dependent on God. I struggle, I mean, I really wrestle with this, beloved to hold on to this and to grasp a good perception of it. To understand the bodily res resurrection, to simply know that Christ was resurrected, to be able to perceive that, that Jesus is the Christ, crucified and resurrected, ascended to the right hand of the Father, and sent the Holy Spirit as our helper, and is coming again for all of His beloved, that means you have the ability to perceive life and true life and defeat it. If you know that is true, that means you have been given the ability through the Spirit of God to perceive that truth and thus to perceive the deepest truths of life, even today. 
If you know that Christ was victorious in his resurrection and that your resurrection is certain in Christ, then today you must know the power of God over life and death. Therefore, spend today in the light of his word that you might perceive his power. Get educated so that you do perceive it, so that you do see it. Lead your children in such a perceptive life. Let them see that this is their father's world, that it's well with your soul, that Christ has brought us peace. His commandments are good. His love is true. He's calling our name. And thus we will sing hallelujah on the great morning and fly away to be present with him evermore. That is our life, our hope, our preparation, our education, our teaching, our training, and everything involved therein. We are a community like no other. Nobody else in the world, no power, no institution, no billionaire has understanding of true life except for you, the believer. But man, they're trying to push their empty promises on you. Step in front of your children and say, not here. It's time to say, as for me and my house, not us. We will worship God. He's enough. Nobody else in the world has it. Do you know what that means? That means nobody else has the same aim, purpose, education, walk, disciplines as a believer because all of this is for you and is sourced in the living, active Word of God. The present power of God and His working in your current life right now, sitting here. God Almighty working in you. You are the light of the world. Teach it to your children. Live it, the light of truth. God's alive, and we shall all behold His glory. Let us live His word today and know His power every day that we walk. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I do pray that you encourage these, your people, I thank you for them. God, refresh them and renew them as they have been through yet another week of walking through a world calling their name. May they hear louder than that your calling. May they know and understand your promises, your truths, and may they rest in them. Again, we ask you remove the words of this preacher And may your spirit teach this, your congregation. Lead them correctly, I do ask, into your wonderful peace and glorious truth. We pray all this by means of Jesus our Lord. Amen.